Hey Optimancers, Chris here. If you have been seeing the online reaction to the Playtest Warlock, you'll know that the new rules for the class have been received extremely well. Actually, they've been received extremely badly. The primary complaint being that they've turned the Warlock into a half-caster. That complaint is misleading. As writing this script, I got a comment on my Sorcerer video that the Warlock doesn't have access to the higher level spells that the Sorcerer does mid-game, so the misinformation is thick. Additional complaints are that in the design notes, the designers say that players wanted the Warlock to be able to cast their spells more often, but this version casts fewer, and the design note was misleading, and the designers failed to deliver. Speaking of misleading, you need some very creative math to come to the conclusion that this Warlock can cast their spells more often. So I will include some simple math where we can see there is no question this Warlock can cast more spells unless we deliberately make emissions to skew the numbers. I'm going to go through all the stuff for the new Warlock and I will do a spellcasting analysis that shows that this Warlock has far exceeded its previous spellcasting ability. I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. I'm just going to show you the things the critics of this playtest Warlock have been silent about that are real positive changes that make this Warlock a big improvement over the current version. It's not perfect. There are some things that should be tweaked, and I will go over those as well. But overall, I consider this a pretty good draft for the new Warlock, and in my opinion, an improvement to the game. So one really cool thing has happened out of the whole debacle with the Warlock. I emailed Jeremy Crawford, and he actually responded to me. I said, I've heard Warlocks aren't getting as many spells as before because they aren't recovered on short rests anymore. Is there anything that can be done? And he responded. He said, hi, Chris, here's what I can do. If you do a video covering the Warlock, let your viewers know that if you get 1,000 new subscribers from the video, I'll give the Warlock more spell slots. And if you get 20 new patrons, I'll make them better at casting spells than the wizard. Now, I wondered if I should apologize for the clickbaity thumbnail. Yeah, I probably should, so sorry about that. Though, it should already be apparent so far that you're about to see an analysis of the Warlock that does fly in the face of the current online discourse. So once we go over the Warlock class features and the Fiend Patron subclass, I'm going to do some spellcasting analysis, and I will show exactly where this Warlock lines up against other spellcasters in D&D, and considering the difficulty of the task of finding the sweet spot for a caster that's not quite a full caster, but leans in that direction, I think the designers have done an amazing job here. As always, we start with the design notes for an overview. Medium armor training has been added to support melee-oriented warlocks. The pack boon is now chosen at first level and provides some free spells, including Eldritch Blast and Hex. Pack magic is replaced by spellcasting. The most requested change to the Warlock by players are for them to be able to cast their spells more often. Eldritch Invocations now caps at 9 instead of 8. Mr. Gorkanum is now an invocation and can be selected as early as 5th level. Contact Patron is a new feature at 11th level and allows the Warlock to contact the Patron directly. Hexmaster is a new 18th level feature. Eldritch Master is gone because it was based on pack magic. And like everyone else, the Warlock will get an epic boon at level 20. So here is the class chart. I, it's hard to look at any of the numbers here without being misled because once you read through the class you realize that all this stuff is different so there's a lot of changes here the big change we have a normal looking spell chart instead of pack magic this is a half progression chart like paladins and rangers have and we will have to talk a lot about this later there are some smaller changes as well invocations now cap out at nine instead of eight but we need to talk about that more later as well the progression actually matches the old Warlock until level 11, at which point we have a slightly accelerated progression. We have prepared spells, also misleading. At level 6, this Warlock falls one behind in spells known compared to the old Warlock and doesn't catch back up until level 17. Also, we need to talk about that. All these things are misleading. If you are looking at this class chart and trying to gauge the Warlock, you should stop because this is not the way to do it. Let's go through all the features, and that's how we'll do it. So as mentioned before, we're going to add medium armor training, and previously it was just light armor. So it's a buff, but it is really relevant that proficiency in shields isn't gained, so this isn't a huge buff. But I'm fine with the change, and it's a step in the right direction. And we see the first change to the multiclassing requirements of a class in the playtest. So previously you needed a 13 charisma to multiclass into or out of Warlock, 
Now it's a 13 in either Intelligence, Wisdom, or Charisma. Doesn't seem to matter which of these abilities you chose as your casting ability, which we will get into later. Multiclassing into Warlock now provides both the light and medium armor training, and spellcasting advances just like Paladin and Ranger in regards to multiclassing. These changes, considering the Warlock design, all make sense to me. Also at first level, we select our pack boon. The packs work differently in addition to being selected two levels earlier. So you will automatically have Eldritch Blast and Hex prepared, and then you will select either the Pact of the Blade, the Chain, or the Tome. We'll have a few spells to review here. We'll take a look at all of them after we go over this entire feature, as well as the rules for Warlock spellcasting. So according to the text, we're still creating a Pact with another worldly entity that we are selecting at level 1. If we select Pact of the Blade, we can select either Wisdom or Charisma as our spellcasting ability score, and we automatically prepare the Pact Weapon spell. If we select Pact of the Chain, we choose from Intelligence or Charisma as our spellcasting ability, and we prepare the Pact Familiar spell. If we select Pact of the Tome, we choose from Intelligence or Wisdom, and we prepare the Book of Shadow spell. So here is how spellcasting works for the Playtest Warlock. First, we can now select spells from the Arcane spell list. There are no restrictions by spell school or anything like that, it's the entire list. This is a massive buff. The Warlock spell list wasn't very good. In fact, of all of the quote-unquote primary spellcasters, the Warlock had the worst list. Now they get the best list. This is dramatic. Cantrips work like other casters. Warlock can switch out a selection after leveling up. And spell slots is a dramatic change. Spell slots are now gained using the half progression chart and are regained after a long rest rather than a short rest. Preparations work the same for warlocks as the other casters in this playtest in that they've abandoned the requirement to prepare one spell of the appropriate level for each spell slot. Now preparations are made based on the prepared spells column and you can prepare spells of any level you can cast. Like the sorcerer, these aren't prepared spells like 5th edition preparation mechanically it's the same as it has always been. You can switch out one prepared spell each time you level up. And your spellcasting ability, as we previously noted, is selected from your pack selection. So let's look at the spells. We have Eldritch Blast, so this one is largely the same as it is in 5th edition. There's a bit of a format change with the cantrip upgrade portion, but mechanically it works exactly as it did before, except for one important detail. Now the scaling of the cantrip isn't based on your character's level, it is based on your warlock level. So if you are a straight class warlock, that doesn't matter at all. And if you're a warlock with like a dip in another class, doesn't matter all that much. But for the many, many, many optimized builds that took two levels of warlock to get Eldritch Blast, Repelling Blast, and Agonizing Blast because it scaled the same whether you continue doing warlock or not, this prevents that. This is going to have an impact on the game, at least in optimization circles. I mean, we knew this was coming. We all knew a year ago this was coming. The way I would put it is, if you take five levels of fighter and you get extra attack, and then you multi-class out of fighter, you shouldn't get the upgrade to extra attack that comes at levels 11 or 20. Eldritch Blast isn't a normal cantrip. It makes a difference that warlocks get the same benefits that non-warlocks do after level 2, in 5th edition. It's a problem. A 20th level Warlock should be better at Eldritch Blast than a 2nd level Warlock with 18 levels of something else. I've been advocating for this change to Eldritch Blast for years, so if you watch this channel, you know I'm on board for this. It's not a power thing, it's a health of the game thing. Now, it does erase existing exploits, and that will mean a blank slate for optimization. Now we have to start from scratch to look for the combos that work together well, and that is brilliant, because it means the builds we've seen and played over and over and over will be going away and replaced with new builds we've never seen or played before. Hex. So this one is redesigned from 5th edition. A lot of things look the same, including casting time, range, duration, the d6 necrotic damage on a hit, the disadvantage on an ability score's checks of your choice, and the ability to switch targets with a bonus action when a target drops to zero hit points. There are two notable changes to the spell. First, they've imposed a limit of delivering the extra damage once per turn. Secondly, the spell used to increase in duration when upcast, but now it increases in both duration as well as damage. So it scales to 2d6 with a third level slot 
and 3d6 was the fifth level slot. This actually reminds me somewhat of the changes we saw to the spiritual weapon spell, where the spell was nerfed if you cast it at its base level, but the upcasting was improved. I'm curious if this trend is going to be carried over to other spells. If so, it might be disappointing that your spells deliver less of an impact than they did before, but it is likely a positive for the health of the game. I have been an advocate for both spells being toned down in power overall, as well as for upcasting to be more impactful. So as much as this spell redesign has received some negative attention online, again, I'm not in agreement. I support changes that improve the health of the game. Now, for regular viewers of my channel, you will know that I do a damage baseline that's based on Eldritch Blast and Hex. So how does this change impact my baseline? Surprisingly, as long as the new Warlock is willing to upcast Hex as they are able, then it doesn't affect it much at all, actually. The red line here represents the 5th edition Warlock with Eldritch Blast, Agonizing Blast, and Hex, and the yellow represents the Playtest Warlock. As you can see, they are neck and neck. These extremely close results make me think that the designers actually considered the math when redesigning Hex, which clearly a lot of people reviewing this design online don't do. The other thing to keep in mind is the disadvantage on ability checks that this spell imposes may be impacted by grapple and shove rules that have changed in the playtest, because at least as they currently are, you can't affect these results with the Hex spell anymore. Overall, I'd say the spell has definitely been nerfed, but the upcasting potential makes it a smaller nerf than it might seem at first. Then again, maybe it doesn't matter. There is a large contingent of the optimization community, me included, that think Hex might be okay at low levels, but by level 5, you have better things to be concentrating on. And if you are casting Hex to combine with Eldritch Blast, and you're no longer casting it at level 5, then the once per turn limitation is kind of not a big deal at all. Moving on to Pact Weapon. So this is a new cantrip that conjures a simpler martial weapon of your choice as an action, or you can touch a magical weapon. The weapon cannot have the heavy property or be a magical weapon attuned to somebody else. For 24 hours, or until you cast a spell again, the weapon gains the following benefits. First, you use your spellcasting ability modifier for attack and damage rolls. Hooray! Second, you gain proficiency in the weapon if you didn't already have it. And third, if the weapon has a thrown property, it immediately returns to your hand after attacking with it. Nice. Then, at 5th level, the cantrip upgrades, and you can attack twice with your packed weapon instead of once when you take the attack action. This was previously achieved with an invocation that was available at 5th level. So this is clearly based on the 3rd level Pact of the Blade feature, but it has received a massive buffing. The part about using your casting ability to attack with a weapon has been something we've wanted ever since the Hexblade was published and we realized all Blade Pact Warlocks should be able to do that. The returning weapon thing is going to be a massive quality of life improvement, especially for Blade Pact Warlocks who happen to find a magical weapon with a throne property. Now, there is one thing that is missing here, and that is the part where the Pact Weapon is considered magical for the purposes of overcoming resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage from non-magical weapons. And if you are a regular viewer, you already knew this was coming before the playtest was released. And when the playtest Monk is released, I'm telling you that Key Empowered Strikes won't appear without a redesign, if it appears at all. This isn't something to be concerned about, because there have been several signs before this playtest was ever released I did a dedicated video that I'm linking above where I talk about this. The whole resistance and immunity to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage from non-magical weapons, I'm almost certain, is going away. I'm not on the design team, so I can't guarantee it 100%, but I would bet money on it. Though it would be nice, designers, if you included a design note for changes like this, confirming why treating weapons as magical have been removed from class features. Maybe it doesn't affect me because I've figured it out and my clever viewers have as well, but I've read comments online of players freaked out by its removal and you could ease some minds. Next is Pact Familiar. We saw a redesign of the Find Familiar spell in the last playtest and it looks like instead of giving the Chain Pack Warlock Find Familiar plus some new options, they just get an entirely unique spell, which is a cantrip rather than a first level ritual spell. The first big change we see from Find Familiar Find Familiar costs 10 gold pieces. 
The next is the creature types available. Chain Warlocks were allowed to choose from Fey, Fiend, or Celestial, but now there's a bigger list of choices. We have Aberration, Celestial, Dragon, Fey, Fiend, or Undead. I like this. It was always difficult to decide from Fey, Fiend, or Celestial if you had, like, an Undead Patron Warlock or the Great Old One. It's a small change, but a good one. We also see a change to what the Familiar can do in combat, and I am curious if Find Familiar is going to be redesigned again to match this. But here, the Familiar is now limited to moving and taking the dodge action unless you use your reaction to command it to attack instead. So this means you cannot command it to feed healing potions or activate the Artificer's spell storing item or use a ring of spell storing or anything like that. I'm good with this. It plugs a hole for action economy abuse. Remote viewing now has no limit on range, and it upgrades at level 5, giving you telepathic communication without range and the ability to speak through the familiar. So these things used to require a dedicated invocation, so essentially chain pack warlocks save an invocation here. And the stat block is pretty good. It naturally scales with the warlock's level rather than requiring upcasting to upgrade like the redesigned find familiar does, and this one is a fair bit more potent. Higher range, dark vision, invisibility at will, condition immunities, highly buffed ability checks and saving throws, the ability to make attacks, though this does require your Warlock's reaction to activate. I like all these changes, though I like templates, and I know some players don't. Speaking of which, since Find Familiar and Pack Familiar are not the same spell, you should be able to cast them both now. Book of Shadows, so also a cantrip. This one is an hour to cast, and you call forth a book filled with Eldritch Magic that you can access. You pick two cantrips, and you choose two first-level spells with the ritual tag from the Arcane, Divine, or Primal spell lists that you already don't have prepared, and now those spells are prepared for you. The Old Pact of the Tome feature gave you three cantrips, but there was an invocation called Book of Shadows you could take that would allow you to gain rituals as well, and you could add rituals to your book, and that option is now gone. Secondly, you can use the book as your spellcasting focus. And thirdly, at level 5, you can add your Warlock spellcasting ability modifier to damage rolls of cantrips that you don't already add that modifier to. So this makes Agonizing Blast redundant at level 5, so you essentially save one invocation, and it is a must-have invocation. So we see with all three of the packs, you're saving an invocation. So I am a fan of Packed Weapon because it enhances what the old Packed Weapon did, and it's going to save you an invocation. So great. Uh, I really like Pack Familiar. It enhances the familiar. It gives you more options. It has a nice upgrade. It saves you an invocation. I'm into all that. Book of Shadows, not a big fan of. The Book of Shadows invocation in 5e gave you the ability to add rituals to your Book of Shadows when you found them. Now, I could understand how they might want to control that. But just removing it all together and just giving you two first level rituals, it's just not enough. Just going to throw in a quick edit here because a patron pointed something out to me about Book of Shadows that makes it a whole lot better than I had originally thought. Because every time you cast this cantrip, you can choose two cantrips and two first level spells that have the ritual tag. They don't have to be the same two cantrips and ritual spells you chose last time you cast the cantrip, meaning that Book of Shadows gives you access to every cantrip in the game and every first level ritual in the game, making it a whole lot better than I had realized. Now we need to talk about invocations, and they are gained at level 2, and we can change one of the invocations we know each time we gain a level. So let's go over the invocations right now. We have pretty extensive design notes sidebar, Let's just go over the invocations themselves. Agonizing Blast is unchanged, except of course the prerequisite, which they no longer need since all Warlocks have Eldritch Blast now. Now if you're packed at the Tome Warlock, this is going to become redundant at 5th level. For everyone else, this is going to be a must-have. Armor of Shadows is unchanged, Mage Armor at will. Ascendant Step is unchanged, Levitate Spell on yourself at will. Beast Speech is unchanged, Speak with Animals at will. Devil's Sight is unchanged, allowing you to see normally in darkness, whether it's magical or not, to a range of 120 feet. I am surprised they didn't address the weird little interaction where Devil's Sight allows you to see normally in darkness, but you're still impacted by dim light, just like someone without dark vision. Anyways, it's the same. Eldritch Sight is the same, Detect Magic at Will. Eldritch Spear is the same, 300 foot range for Eldritch Blast. 
Eyes of the Rune Keeper is mostly unchanged, except now it adds that, although you can read all writing, the invocation doesn't decode secret messages in text. And I wonder which players thought Eyes of the Rune Keeper did that. I guess some players have some pretty lenient DMs. Favor of the Chainmaster is an invocation for Pact of the Chain Warlocks with a prerequisite of 9th level, and it makes your Pact Familiar more powerful with its attack, adding an enhancement when the attack hits. The enhancement depends on the type of creature your familiar is. Keep in mind that you aren't stuck with a single familiar type. You can change it out every time you cast Pact Familiar. An Aberration gets Slowing Slime, and the target has its speed reduced by 15 until the end of your next turn, and it can't take the dash or disengage actions. Removing dash from a slowed creature, that is devastating. A Celestial gets Guiding Light, and it's a bit like Guiding Bolt, providing advantage on the next attack against the target before the end of your next turn, and it also suppresses the invisible condition. Nice. A Dragon gets Draconic Might, and it imposes the prone condition on a medium or smaller target. There is no saving throw. Cool. The Fey gets Beguiling Sting, which imposes the charm condition for the familiar and you, and again, no saving throw. Wow. The Fiend gets Unearthly Toxin, and it imposes Poisoned, again no saving throw. And Undead gets Whispers of the Grave. This imposes Frightened, of either you or the familiar, your choice, and again, no saving throw. So this is a must-have for Chain Packed Warlocks. Must. Have. These are nasty, and none of them are weak. Every single one is pretty good. Of course, poison immunity is still a common thing, unless they change that. Fiendish Vigor is unchanged. False Life at will. Gaze of Two Minds got a huge buffing. The old version allowed you to perceive through another senses, and it took your action to activate and maintain. Now it has a fifth level prerequisite, and it's a bonus action to use and maintain. And get this, you can cast spells as if you were in the other creature's space. That's really powerful, and it's going to be really tasty for Pact of the Chain Warlocks, though I think I would pretty much take this on any Warlock. If you have played a Scribe Wizard, and I have right to level 17, that ability to just change your casting position is really nice for all kinds of spells. It's so powerful that I think this actually probably needs a limit, like proficiency bonus times per long rest or something. Gift of the Protectors was in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, and it's apparently being ported over to the new player's handbook, which is nice. It's a good Pact of the Tome invocation. Works the same as before. You can have a number of creatures write their name in your special book, equal to your proficiency bonus, and the next time one of those creatures is reduced to zero hit points, they're reduced to one hit point instead. Then you can't use it again until you finish a long rest. Hexer is new, and it increases the range of your Hex spell from 90 feet to 600 and you have advantage on constitution saving throws to maintain concentration on it. And I wouldn't take this. I mean, 90 feet is plenty, and I'm probably taking Warcaster anyways. Anything over a couple hundred feet in range is really just numbers. It's probably not going to come up. Lessons of the first ones is pretty interesting. You take this invocation and you select one first level feat, and you get it. They say, such as skilled, but we know we're using this to pick up lucky or alert, or maybe tough. This is a strong invocation. Life Drinker is a redesign. The old version wasn't available until 12th level, and it added your charisma bonus as necrotic damage on your packed weapon attacks. Now it's available at 9th level, so it's a fair bit earlier. Instead of adding your charisma bonus, you're adding a d6, but you also regain the same number of hit points. So this is cool, and I mean, it really is now Life Drinker. I like it. Mask of Many Faces is the same. Disguise Self at Will. Pretty nice invocation, in my opinion. Master of Myriad Forms is unchanged, 15th level, and Alter Self at will. Never been a fan of the Alter Self spell, so never been a fan of this invocation. Misty Visions is a personal favorite to the point where I occasionally take the Eldritch Invocation feat on a non-Warlock just to get this. In fact, I'm playing a Rune Knight fighter in a current long-running campaign with this invocation from that feat. One with shadows is the same. You can become invisible in dim light or darkness until you do something other than move. They've added that you can't take a bonus action, which is just clear wording as you are likely never intended to be allowed to take bonus actions for anything that prohibited actions. Otherworldly Leap is jump at will. It's the same. I've never taken this invocation and I don't see that changing. Repelling Blast is changed to restrict the force movement to large size or smaller opponents. This was a bit of a surprise to me because... Although the change here makes sense, 
I would have predicted it was going to be limited to once on your turn instead, so it would match up with Grasp of Adar. So you can still repel multiple times with your Aldrich Blast, but not huge or larger enemies. Visions of Distant Realms is unchanged, and it is a decent invocation. Arcane Eye at will, but not until really high level. Whispers of the Grave is the same. Speak with Dead at will with a ninth level prerequisite. And Witch Sight is changed. It used to allow the seeing of true form of shape changers or creatures concealed by illusions or transmutations within 30 feet of you. Now it's just True Sight 30 feet. Good change. Okay, so let's go back to the big one, Mystic Arcanum. So in the current rules, the majority of class features the Warlock gets from level 11 onwards are Mystic Arcanum. At level 11, they select one spell from the Warlock spell list of 6th level, then at 13th level, a 7th level spell, then at 15th level, an 8th level spell, and at 17th level, a 9th level spell. They could cast that spell once per long rest, and they couldn't change it. In Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, they got the ability to change one Mystic Arcanum selection when they reached a level that granted an ability score improvement. So this was kind of like having a spell slot of these levels, but not exactly. Because you were limited to one spell, you could only cast that spell, you couldn't upcast a lower level spell with it, and you couldn't switch out that spell. Now Mystic Arcanum is an invocation. You can select it as early as 5th level, and it's the only invocation you can select multiple times. And because we can switch out invocations with every level, that means we can switch out our Mystic Arcanums more easily than we could before. The invocation allows you to select one spell from the arcane spell list with a maximum spell level based on your current warlock level and you can cast it once per long rest. I want to discuss how much better this is than it previously was. So in the existing rules, if you play a warlock, a straight warlock, and you get to level 15, you will be picking an 8th level mystic arcanum. And because you're dealing with the lousy warlock spell list, these are your selections. You can choose demiplane, dominate monster. Feeble Mind, Glibness, Maddening Darkness, or Power Word Stun, you can cast it once per day. If you don't cast it on any given day, there's nothing else you can do with that feature because it's not a spell slot. You can't upcast a 7th level spell with it or a 6th level spell with it. You either cast the spell you selected or it's wasted. In the playtest, the differences between Mystic Arcanum and an actual spell slot haven't changed. You still can't cast any other spell with it. You still can't change it from day to day, but... Look at the list we have to choose from now. Would it be easier to find a spell on this list that you might be casting regularly than that previous list? Like, for example, there's Maze. So if you take this invocation more than once, you have to choose a spell of a different level than any other Mystic Arcanum selections you have. That means, in theory, we could spend all nine invocations that our Warlock will eventually receive on the Mystic Arcanum invocation, taking one spell of every spell level. If we look at this chart, it's up to 3rd level spells at 5th level, 4th level spells at 7th level, 5th level spells at 9th level, and all the rest match what you would have received with Mr. Arcanum for those levels of spells in the current edition. So obviously it is quite different for this to be an optional invocation instead of a built-in class feature. And for one thing, it is going to make our initial class chart a little misleading because it's showing that we get more invocations but if we have to select this as one of our invocations, we actually have fewer, even though we're saving one with our pack selection. So yeah, we're actually getting fewer invocations, but more spells if we select this. Now, I can only imagine the reason that they didn't build it into the Warlock and instead made it an optional invocation is to give us an option to customize. So if we wanted to lean more into spellcasting, we could. If we wanted to lean more into other stuff, we could. Uh, so it does make the Warlock very customizable. Now there is something I really don't like about this. Mechanically, I think it is fine. But when you are a player and you have an option that you have to take, and I mean, when you're 17th level and you have the option of getting a 9th level spell or an option of being able to read any writing, that's not a real option. You have to take the 9th level spell. And when you present a false option that just isn't all that fun because we're not actually picking. We just have to take that one thing. So I think what I would like to see here, I like the idea of it kind of being an invocation at these lower levels so we can customize. But when I get to higher levels, I'm going to have to take this. So maybe at those levels, it should just be built in because it's not a real option. It is something that we are definitely going to take. 
but I want to go through the rest of the Warlock before we deep dive into spellcasting. There's not that much to go through. Warlock is 99% spells and invocations. At 3rd level we get a subclass feature. At 4th level we get a feat. At 5th level we get an invocation. At 6th level we get a subclass feature. At 7th level we get an invocation. At 8th level we get a feat. At 9th level we get an invocation. At 10th level we get a subclass feature. And at 11th level we get a new Warlock feature, Contact Patron. In the past, you have usually contacted your patron through intermediaries. Now you can communicate directly. You always have the contact other plane spell prepared. With this feature, you can cast a spell without expending a spell slot to contact your patron and you automatically succeed on the spell's saving throw. And you can do this once per long rest. So the contact other plane spell is a fifth level spell, it takes a minute to cast, and it has the ritual tag. Since we will have this spell prepared, we could cast it as a ritual if we like, but we only avoid the saving throw with the one free non-ritual casting. You mentally contact a demigod, long dead sage, or some other mysterious entity from another plane. For a warlock, it's going to be whomever they selected as their patron. The caster makes a DC 15 intelligent saving throw, or takes 66 psychic damage, and, get this, can't take actions. They also can't read or communicate until they take a long rest or have a greater restoration cast on them. So failing the save on contact other plane is very bad. On a successful saving throw, you can ask up to five questions within the one minute duration of the spell. You get one word answers such as yes, no, maybe, never, irrelevant, or unclear if the entity doesn't know the answer to the question. If a one word answer would be misleading, the DM might offer a short phrase as an answer instead. So this is a solid divination, with normally a pretty big risk involved. But the Warlock can do it risk-free once per day. I would mean I would use this every day. It is a good feature. I also like the flavor of this. It is really appropriate for the Warlock. Then at 11th level we get an Invocation, 12th level we get a Feed, 13th level we get an Invocation, 14th level we get a Subclass Feature, 15th level we get an Invocation, 16th level we get a Feed, 17th level we get access to 9th level Spells, and then at 18th level we get our other unique Warlock Feature, Hexmaster. And I do not know what happened with 18th level features in this playtest, so this one allows the Warlock to cast Hex at 1st level for free. Anytime you have a feature like this that lets you cast a spell, unless it says specifically otherwise, it's always cast at the minimum level. Though, in fairness, I probably wouldn't want to cast Hex at higher levels either at 18th level. Hex requires concentration, and now we have a character with 1st through 9th level spells. Or at least we likely do, because you'd be an idiot not to take 6th, 7th, 8th, and 9th level Mystic Arcanum invocations. So with all the amazing higher level spells we'll have available, we're not going to want to use Concentration on Hex. I don't get what happened here. This is essentially worthless or very close to worthless. I get why they wanted a unique feature here, because the old Warlock capstone involved recovering pack slots, and those no longer exist. And there are first level spells where if you got an at will casting of, would be really helpful, even at 18th level. Shield spell without expending a spell slot. Sign me up. And fixing this could be as easy as that. The feature could allow you to pick a first level spell you have prepared, and then you can cast it without expending a spell slot. But you know, if you wanted to stick with the flavor, as the text reads, you have mastered the dread application of hexes. Well, then this feature could allow you to improve the hex spell rather than just cast it more often. Like maybe when you cast hex, it doesn't use your concentration. Or maybe the ability check you choose to inhibit also impacts saving throws, or attacks using that ability, or both. These are just some ideas, but as it stands, this is a bad feature. Then a feat at 19th level, and an epic boon at level 20. But before I evaluate the Warlock class as a whole, let's look at the playtest subclass, the Fiend Patron. The Fiend Patron subclass in the Player's Handbook is actually one of my favorites. I would consider it an underrated Warlock subclass overall, definitely in the top half, and arguably in the top three. So we start out with Patron Spells, and these have been massively buffed. In the current edition, patron spells are simply added to the class list so you can select them with your known spells. Of course, that wouldn't be much of anything now. Since the Warlock has access to the entire Arcane spell list library, 
So now all the patron spells are automatically known. That is 10 additional spells known. The Warlock will actually end up with a massive quantity of spells known. 15 regular arcane spell list selections, hex for free, contact other plane for free, and 10 patron spells for free means an absolutely huge list, 27 spells known. This is not a bad list at all. Command is a good spell, Suggestion is a good spell, Fear is a really good spell, Wall of Fire is a good spell. There's some stinkers here too, but overall this is a solid list. And so you know all these for free, and you can cast one of them for free every day. Now, something I've heard online are complaints that the Fiend Pact Warlock no longer gets the Fireball spell. That is misinformation. Yes, you do get the Fireball spell. It is an arcane spell. All Warlocks get the Fireball spell now. Or maybe the criticism is that the Fiend Warlock no longer automatically gets the Fireball spell. That is also misinformation. The Fiend Patron Warlock never got the Fireball spell automatically. It was available for selection with their spells known. It still is. The only change is it's available to other Warlocks now too. The Fiend Patron Warlock has objectively lost nothing here. They have only gained. They've gained the free casting of a spell and 10 additional spells known. And these are all extras they didn't get before. Everything they got, they still get, but it was covered by the massive increases to spells available. Okay, on to the features. So at third level, we get Dark One's Blessing. This was previously gained at first level. However, there are some minor changes here. First, the temporary hit points used to be automatically based on charisma. Now with a flexible spellcasting ability, you get whatever ability you chose. The second is you previously only gained the temps if you dropped the enemy. Now if they're within five feet of you, you get the temps even if somebody else finished them off. It's a nice little boost. It's particularly going to be nice for Blade Pack Warlocks, who are more likely to be in that close. Then at 6th level, we get Dark One's Own Luck, which was also previously a 6th level feature. This allows you to add a d10 to an ability check or saving throw after you roll, but before the effects of the roll take place. This used to be once per short or long rest, and now it is usable a number of times equal to your spellcasting ability modifier, and all uses are recovered after a long rest. So that is a net boost that's pretty significant. Being able to do this more than once in a combat itself is a notable buff. But also, eventually it's going to be five times per day, which is going to be more uses than you ever would have had before, even if you take a lot of short rests. Then at level 10, we get Fiendish Resilience, which we got before at the same level. This feature allows you to choose one damage type and you get resistance to it, and you can change out the selection after a short or long rest. The old feature had a restriction that if you were damaged by magical or silver weapons, it would ignore that resistance. So, as I mentioned previously in this video, we see those kinds of exceptions being removed from the game and good riddance, so now that restriction isn't in place. Instead, they say you can't choose forced damage. I mean, no problem. I was never going to be selecting forced damage resistance. If you don't know what kind of damage to expect, I would recommend bludgeoning or slashing damage. Those seem to come up the most often. Anyways, it's another feature that's boosted. Then at 14th level, my favorite Fiend Pack feature, Hurl Through Hell, which has always been 14th level Fiend Pack Warlock feature, and might be my favorite all-time Warlock subclass feature. So the old version, when you hit a creature with an attack roll, you can hurl the target through the lower planes. They disappear. No saving throw. No saving throw. Then they reappear at the end of your next turn, and they take 10d10 psychic damage if they aren't a fiend, still totally worth it if they are, and you can't do it again until you finish a long rest. It's like a little mini maze spell, except it can't be counterspelled. So here's the new version. When you hit a creature with an attack roll, you can transport the target through the lower planes. No saving throw. Perfect. They reappear at the end of your next turn, and they've added a wisdom saving throw to take half damage. Eh, whatever. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a long rest, unless you expand a spell slot of at least 4th level when you use it again. So, personal experience for you. I played a 20th level Fiend Pact Warlock in a one-shot where we faced a Challenge 30 spellcasting NPC with minions and a tactical advantage on the map, and I used Hurl Through Hell on round 1, and it won the fight. By the time they returned, the minions were dead, the tactical advantage was removed, and it was just a matter of finishing up. This is awesome, and way better than most 4th level spells. It is totally worth that slot. 
Okay, so before I talk about the Warlock, just a quick summary of the Fiend Pack Warlock. I universally like it. I like the patron spells. I like the additional spells known. I like the free casting. I like the ability to get the temporary hit points, even if I don't drop an enemy. The extra uses of Dark One's own luck. The removal of the restrictions on Fiendish Resilience. And the ability to reuse my favorite Warlock subclass feature. This is 10 out of 10. But now I want to review the Warlock playtest class. I'm just going to start with the most contentious issue with the playtest Warlock. Is it a half caster? No. Is it a full caster? No. This has always been the case and continues to be the case. But any criticisms you've heard online that the new Warlock is now a half caster are at worst disingenuous, though probably just sloppy and misleading. The Warlock Clash chart has never in the history of 5th edition accurately represented the spellcasting ability of Warlocks precisely because of Mystic Arcanum. Pact Magic caps at 5th level spells, but a 17th level Warlock casts up to 9th level spells, just like Druids, Clerics, Wizards, and Sorcerers. They've never matched these classes in terms of spell list, spell versatility, or number of spellcastings. Also, Mystic Arcanum aren't exactly spell slots. They're a bit more restrictive, so I've never really known whether to refer to Warlocks as full casters or not. They're kind of three-quarters casters. If you've ever played a straight Warlock at 5th level or 10th level in a party with full spellcasters, you know that you aren't a full spellcaster really quickly. I've also heard claims that the playtest Warlock actually casts fewer spells than the 5th edition Warlock, and that too is either sloppy or disingenuous. The player feedback was that we wanted to be able to use our spells more often as a warlock. Claims this request wasn't granted are wrong, and I'm going to show that to you right now. So let's actually look at numbers with the complete picture, which includes a complete picture of warlock spellcasting ability. This includes spells gained through the class chart, through subclass, and through Mystic Arcanum, and let's compare it to other spellcasters. Here's what half casting looks like in D&D. I should specify this is the half casting in the playtest, not the current edition. This represents the spells a ranger can cast, and it almost represents the paladin, but with the paladin it actually looks more like this, because they have one free casting from their subclass spell list. But in either case, we would refer to this as half casting, because with these classes, they advance in spellcasting potential at half the rate of full casters. So when they reach 17th level, they have achieved a casting potential four levels higher than when they started at first level. While a full caster achieves casting potential eight levels higher. If a warlock didn't select Mystic Arcanum at all, then it would be fair to call them a half caster as well. But that's not likely to happen, so it's not accurate. Now here's what a full caster gets. This is your cleric, your druid, your sorcerer, and wizard. This isn't, nor has it ever been, the warlock. When you see this chart on a class, you know that this chart represents the weight of their class features, because spells are class features. So when a Barbarian gets extra attack, the full spellcaster is getting 3rd level spells instead. Now let's assume with our Warlock we take a 3rd level spell when it's available, then a 4th, and a 5th, and a 6th, and a 7th, and an 8th, and a 9th. Well, that's what that would look like. Now for context, this chart represents the number of spells of each level that a Warlock selecting this Mystic Arcanum selections would be able to cast. It also includes the spells provided by our subclass, so this chart is not the number of spells we cast from our spells known, like it would be with spell slots. Warlocks have more restrictive spell casting options than other classes. That's always been the case, and in some ways it's even more restrictive now, and in other ways it's less restrictive. This chart does not include the free casting of Contact Other Plane because we don't choose that spell at all. Every spell represented here we select either at the time of casting or at the time of Mystic Arcanum selection. On the right-hand column, I've included the cost of invocation selections for this spellcasting progression. As you can see, if you go this way, it's extremely expensive in terms of invocations to achieve this amount of spells. Also notice there's some weird progression. Like look how at 8th level we cast 4 second level spells, then at 9th level it's 3. Well at 9th level we jump from 1 to 4 third level spells all of a sudden. Still, if we compare this side by side with half casting, it's clearly not half casting or anywhere close to half casting. 
If we compare it to full casting, it's much closer, though it's still not quite there. But in this case, the Warlock has spent almost all their invocation selections on Mystic Arcanum. Now, you could go all in on spellcasting. So you could spend all your invocations just trying to match full spellcasters. And how does that look? Here is the Warlock Max Caster Spell Slot Progression. What you need to do is at level 5, you select one third level Mystic Arcanum, and you switch one of your existing invocations to grab a second level Mystic Arcanum. Then at level 6, you switch your other invocation to a first level Mystic Arcanum, and then for every other invocation you get, you select the highest level Mystic Arcanum. This route uses 100% of available invocations from level 6 onwards. Now, I personally would not recommend or go this route. I think invocations are way too valuable to be spending entirely on Mystic Arcanum, only to fall short of full spellcasting. But there is a massive variance between a Warlock that spends all their invocations and none of their invocations on Mystic Arcanum, and I don't think either route is optimal, nor would I expect players to take either of those options. So I've mapped out what I would consider an optimal spellcasting balance. This uses Mystic Arcanum as needed to progress our spellcasting in a balanced fashion and leave us invocations to enjoy elsewhere. I'm calling this the Treant Monk Warlock spellcasting progression. And here is how it works. At level 5, I take a level 3 Mystic Arcanum. At level 7, I take a level 4 Mystic Arcanum. At level 9, I switch my level 3 Mystic Arcanum to a level 5 Mystic Arcanum. And then at level 11, I take a level 6 Mystic Arcanum. Then at level 13, I switch my level 4 Mystic Arcanum to a level 7 Mystic Arcanum. Then at level 15, I take a level 8 Mystic Arcanum. And at level 17, I switch my level 5 Mystic Arcanum to a level 9 Mystic Arcanum. So viewer I was having a conversation with in the Sorcerer video when you were saying you don't access the higher level spells at mid-level... Yes, you do. You just have to take those invocations back and place them into higher level spells later once those spell levels are achieved. It's actually not complicated at all. I've added another column to the right, Invocations Available. So these are the invocations I'm not using on Mystic Arcanum. As you can see, it starts out at 2, and then it eventually progresses up to 5 at level 20. The spell chart here is fairly smooth in progression. Let's look at it side by side with a half caster. I think it is self-evident this is no half-caster. Now let's look at it side-by-side side with a full spellcaster. Well, it's obviously not full spellcasting either, though I would say it's closer to full casting than half-casting, so maybe instead of a 75% caster, it's more like an 80 or 85% caster. Now let's pretend I'm a chain-packed warlock and using this progression. How invocation-hungry am I? Well, I'd probably start with Agonizing Blast and Repelling Blast at level 2, so my Eldritch Blast is solid. The next invocation I really want is Favor of the Chainmaster, which is awesome. That's a level 9 prerequisite, and look at that. That's exactly when I have a third invocation available. It is smooth. Then at level 13, I'll add Gaze of Two Minds, which looks really awesome now. And at level 17, I guess Lessons of the First Ones, and I'll grab Alert or Lucky, whichever one I didn't take at level 1. So I'm not invocation hungry, really at all. I get the invocations I want, when I want them. There's nothing left over, but there's enough. But how about the current Warlock? Here's the current Warlock spellcasting, assuming two short rests. However, when we talk about restrictive spellcasting, we also have to talk about the restrictive spellcasting of pack magic. Because when you see six fifth level slots there at 10th level, it's not six castings per long rest, so much as two castings per short rest. And that loss of flexibility means you can't just cast these spells when you need them. You can cast two of them when you really need them, and that's not as good. And it is a restriction the new Warlock doesn't have. Also, I'm suddenly hearing all about the DM guide and how it assumes two short rests per long rest. Okay, but that didn't seem to change how we played the game. I mean, sometimes I play and we take two short rests, but a lot of the time, it's one short rest between long rests. And I've even seen zero short rests. You know when you see zero short rests? When the fights are super tough. Like that last fight was way tougher than expected, and we can't go on without retreating and getting our stuff back. And that's the worst time to have packed magic. But let's assume the generous assumption of two short rests, 
and let's ignore the restriction of not being able to cast these spells whenever we want to. Okay, then who casts more spells? Well, let's add them up. So we have a massive number of spells at level 2 on the current Warlock because two short rest isn't really happening most of the time, but we gave it to them anyways because we are being generous. I mean, a picture is worth a thousand words. Look at level 5 onwards. Even with two short rests, the new Warlock still casts more spells. Of course, point this out, and that's when the goalposts are going to move. Oh yeah, but the old Warlock casts more 5th level spells. Well, the playtest Warlock has a bunch of lower level spells. Like at 11th level, the old Warlock has 51 total spell levels worth of spells. So if they're going to give them lower level spells, it should total 51 levels. No, dummy. That's the trade-off. A full spellcaster only has 47 total levels worth of spells at 11th level. So is the old Warlock a better spellcaster than a full spellcaster? No. Adding up spell levels isn't an accurate measure. You don't get to have Eldritch Blast, Invocations, and be a full spellcaster. Obviously. It is a ridiculous expectation that would make the game worse if you pressured the designers into it. The Warlock has never been a full spellcaster, and it still isn't. But it's most of the way there, and it has more spells to cast. Just like we asked for, and the designers have given us. The new Warlock is a Warlock with a better quality of life. I think they just about hit the bullseye here. Just about, because I do have some criticisms. First, Mystic Arcanum should be available at level 3, with access to up to 2nd level spell slots. This earlier access would help patch up the one place in the progression where the Warlock will really feel like a half-caster, levels 3 and 4. This doesn't give us any more Mystic Arcanum potential in the long run, since we can select each level of spell only once either way, but it simply gives the Warlock access to 2nd level spells when they should have it. Second, some Mystic Arcanums should be built in, and that way you can choose Mystic Arcanum as an invocation if you want to enhance your spellcasting, but the points where it's not really a choice, where it's a must-have, they should just get it. Third, Hexmaster sucks. It's basically a worthless feature at level 18, when other classes are getting their old capstones. It should be buffed to be impactful, even though some critics of this subclass are putting way too much attention on this. I mean, you just got a 9th level spell at 17th level, from a superior list, there's Meteor Swarm and Wish and Shape Change, none of those were there before. And the 18th level feature, being a letdown, means the Warlock is weak? Get real. This is barely even relevant. We're talking 18th level. But they should fix it anyways. And Invocations. Let's get them more balanced. Nobody is going to want to spend an Invocation to read any writing when Comprehend Languages is an available spell with the Ritual Tag. Give them the same treatment you gave to Metamagic. But overall, this Warlock, especially considering the challenge of adjusting a short rest recovery based class to be long rest recovery, I thought was pretty close to the mark. Now if you are one of those players who's upset that short rest recovery features are going away in the new edition, and you want a game where some characters need short rests and others don't, then we have to disagree, because after 9 years of that, I'm done with it. So yeah, I am in big disagreement with the online community on this one, but that is the Warlock. One more class left, the wizard, which I will cover in my next video. Until then, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks everybody, and I will talk to you soon. Thank you to Hey Mr. Wonderful, Arden, Babrak, Blue Wolf, Blue Eyes White 7, Condor, John D, Discarpus 9, El Conquista Dorito, Eric H, Falcon Neal, Glenn Wilson, Jared Huberger, John Wayne, Joseph Hall, Joseph Robido, Joseph Rogers, Joshua Doring, Wu Carl Kong, Lila Corpsegrave, Makatu, Lone Pilgrim, Maddie, Michael Michelle, Moxie, Nemo, Prometheo NTG, Purge Thunder, Reichenstahl, Ryan Wilmot, Samwise, Shane and Todd Beyond, Earshine, The Noam Chomsky, Third, Valentine, and Wade.